Do you want to play a deck that has the draw power and mana generation of green with the adaptability and control element of blue? Do you enjoy a deck that has unique lines of play and can pivot between combat and combo to close out a game? Do you like the idea of everyone's turn being your turn? Then let's see just what's possible with Yeva Nature's Herald. Let's begin by having a look at what our commander does. Yeva is a 4-4 elf shaman that costs 2 generic and 2 green mana and says flash, and you may cast green creature spells as though they had flash. So on the surface level, Yeva would appear to be like every other mono green deck, make lots of mana, draw lots of cards, and close out the game with combat damage. And while she certainly does those things, the seemingly simple ability of giving our creatures flash opens up so much more. Worried about a board wipe? Wait until your opponent's end step before your turn to cast your creatures. Maybe you need to destroy a game ending artifact or enchantment. Well, cast your ETB creature to stop them in their tracks. Even the simple ability of being able to flash in a blocker in response to your opponent's attacking means they'll always have to ask the question, just what could be in your hand? And this is only scratching the surface. But before we get too ahead of ourselves, let's start as we almost always do by discussing our most straightforward and direct win cons. First up is the green classic, Craterhoof Behemoth. This deck runs 48 creatures, many of them with a low mana value, so it won't be difficult to cast this and make it a lethal attack for at least 1-2 to two players. Now in any other mono green deck, the discussion would normally stop there, but with Yeva, we can open up interesting and unique lines of play. What if you have Craterhoof in hand, ready to swing out for lethal next turn, but an opponent casts a Toxic Deluge on their turn? Well, instead of losing your board like many other green decks, you can cast this in response to save it. You can even use this trick in response to an opposing army swinging out to kill you, effectively saving your life and taking out most, if not all of your opponent's attacking creatures. Our second and last main win con is Shaman of Forgotten Ways. Early in the game, it acts as a mana dork for creature spells specifically, but in the mid to late game with the right board setup, we can drain our opponent's life totals low enough to finish them with combat damage. This will be especially easy to do against decks that are creature light. Now I know that only two main win cons seems like it wouldn't be enough, but a good number of our creatures do bring with them respectable power and toughness stats, so sometimes wins will come just through regular combat damage. Not only this, but because of the large utility package we run, combined with our ability to combo off in a number of ways, we actually have multiple lines of victory that we can pivot between depending on the board state. But before we get to that, we need to understand all the other cards we're running in the deck, so let's begin with our mana acceleration package. Birds of Paradise, Boreal Druid, Elvish Mystic, Fintorn Elves, Jiraga Tree Speaker, and Lanoir Elves have all been included because they are turn 1 ramp, creatures, and all but the birds are elves, which has important synergy with some of the other cards we run in the deck. One of those cards is Priest of Titania, which can add green mana to our mana pool for each elf on the battlefield, which also includes our opponents. Similar, but costing one more mana and only counting our elves, is Elvish Arch Druid, who does provide a small but not insignificant plus one plus one boost to all of our other elves. Marwen the Nurturer also cares about elves, adding green mana based on her power and gaining a plus one plus one counter every time another elf we control ETBs. With 20 elves in our deck, including our commander, all three of these creatures can generate a large amount of mana for little cost. Wild Growth and Utopia Sprawl are both one mana enchantments that can tap for one green. After turn one, if they enchant an untapped land, they also provide the mana straight away, which can be relevant quite often. It also has some synergy with untap effects, such as our next card, Arbor Elf. On its own, it can tap to untap a forest, essentially providing us with one green mana, but if it untaps a land enchanted by Wild Growth or Utopia Sprawl, now it is netting us two green mana instead. Lanoir Tribe is a three mana elf that can tap for three green, which is a great rate for the cost. Having many of our mana accelerators cost in one mana means that curving into a three mana dork, such as Lanoir Tribe, is ideal and will really set us ahead of our opponents in the mana department. Somberwold Sage also costs three mana and produces three mana of any one color, but this mana can only be spent on creature spells. Our creature density means that this will almost always be able to cast all the cards in our hand and like Lanoir Tribe is a great card to curve into. Salvala, Heart of the Wilds, is a mana dork that can also act as card draw in the right circumstances. Any time a player, and yes that does include our opponents, has a creature ETB, if that creature's power is currently the greatest on the battlefield, then that player can draw a card. Now while we do run a good number of creatures that can trigger this effect, many of our creatures are typically low to moderate in power, so we will only trigger this here and there, 
but that isn't why she's in the deck. If we pay one green and tap her, she can add X mana in any combination of colours where X is the greatest power among creatures we control. So at worst, with our commander in play, if we pay one green, we net three green mana, similar to our previous three mana dorks, which is worthy on its own. But some of our creatures, as you will see later, can get Selvala to tap for six, ten, and even more mana, which means the ceiling can be incredibly high for her. Wirewood Channeler is just the more expensive version of Priest of Titania, costing four mana, but the effect is so powerful it is still worthy of inclusion, especially with the amount of untap effects we run. Earthcraft is an enchantment that allows us to tap one of our creatures to untap a basic land. This effect is great when we are casting low cost creatures who have summoning sickness, because this essentially allows us to use them to generate one green mana straight away. Not only this, but we can use our Arbor Elf and Wild Growth Utopia Sprawl trick where if a basic forest is enchanted, now each untap from Earthcraft generates two mana. Growing Rites of Itlamok is an enchantment that upon ETB lets us look at the top four cards of our library, reveal a creature card and put it in our hand. But at the end step, if we control four or more creatures, a requirement that won't be hard at all for us to achieve, then it flips and becomes Itlamok Cradle of the Sun. This is a land that can tap for green or one green for each creature we control. In a deck with 48 creatures, most of which have a low mana value, this land will be able to tap for an insane amount of mana. And at worst, if we get board wiped, it still taps for one green and will get progressively better again as we rebuild our board state. Circle of Dreams Druid is almost an Itlamok on a creature, costing three mana and adding a green for each creature we control. But having this effect on a body, while initially seeming like a downside because it can be removed more easily, is actually an upside because many of our untap effects only work on creatures. Being able to get two tap effects from this card will put you so far ahead on mana that the only thing stopping you from casting cards will be how many you have in your hand. However, there is one other creature that can actually produce more mana on average than Druid, and that is Karametra's Acolyte. Costing one more at four mana, this card adds an amount of green equal to our devotion to green. Our deck largely consists of permanents, and 58 of those contribute green pips for devotion. Just look at some of the creatures we just discussed, like Lanoir Tribe, and you can see that it isn't hard for Karametra's Acolyte to tap for 10 to 20 mana, sometimes more. And if we have just one untap effect, well, our opponents had better hope we don't have any card draw online. And speaking of card draw, now that we've seen just how much mana this deck can generate, let's look at the cards that are going to keep the engine fueled. Beast Whisperer is a 4 mana elf that draws us a card with every creature spell we cast. Because most of our spells we cast will actually occur on our opponent's turns, it's important to have card draw that can trigger at any time, not just on our turn. Duskwatch Recruiter allows us to pay 2 generic and a green mana as much as we'd like to look at the top 3 cards of our library and reveal a creature card to put into our hand. The density of creatures in this deck means that this ability will fizzle far and few between and really allows us to dig for the right creatures we need at the given moment. That, combined with the huge mana this deck can generate, means it won't be uncommon to activate this multiple times a turn cycle, generating significant card advantage. And if we hit one of our combos that lets us generate infinite mana, we can pretty much win the game then and there, even in an opponent's turn. Glade Muse is a 3 mana creature that generates us card advantage by drawing us a card every time we cast a spell on an opponent's turn. Now it is important to note that this also works for your opponents, meaning the effect is symmetrical, something I usually try to avoid at all costs. But because our deck operates on the notion of playing during our opponent's turns, perhaps more than most other decks, we should be able to gain this advantage far greater than they can. This is just a card you will have to time properly so that it doesn't hurt us more than it helps us. Guardian Project is an enchantment that allows us to draw a card every time one of our non-token creatures enters the battlefield. This is similar to Beast Whisperer in raw draw power and while not a creature itself, being an enchantment means it is less prone to removal and can refill our hand should a board wipe occur. Oran Frostfang is a 5 mana creature that gives attacking creatures we control death touch and draws us a card for each creature that deals combat damage. While we are limited to drawing cards in our turn, the large amount of cards it can draw us, especially in the early game if one player doesn't have any creatures on board to block us, warrants its inclusion. We can also use this as a combat trick to remove opponent's creatures. If we swing into attack and we wait until our opponents block, we can flash this in giving our creatures death touch and killing all the creatures that are blocking us. Trade in a mana dork for a commander or other relevant creature will not only make our opponents sad, but they will be hesitant to block us in the future if we have mana open. Primordial Sage is a 6 mana version of Beast Whisperer, but its ability being so strong, combined with the fact it is a creature itself which is so important for many cards in our deck, means it earns a place in the deck. 
Regal Force draws us a card for each green creature we control upon ETB. Although costing 7 mana, this can draw us a huge amount of cards if our board state is even moderately set up. This is especially useful to cast in response to a board wipe, so that we can recover quickly and get back into the game. Return of the Wild Speaker fulfills two roles. Firstly, it can draw us cards based on the highest power of a non-human creature we control. The floor should usually be 4 cards thanks to our commander, which is a respectable rate at instant speed, but this can sometimes draw us 6 to 7 or more cards with the right creature on board. And secondly, it can act as a finisher to take 1 to 2 players out if our board is wide enough by granting all our non-human creatures plus 3 plus 3 until end of turn. But don't just look at it as a finisher, because you can use it defensively too. If someone is swinging in with big creatures and we mostly have mana dorks out, this can quickly turn them into effective blockers that your opponents weren't expecting. Rishkar's expertise allows us to draw cards based on the highest power among creatures we control, and then allows us to cast a spell of mana value 5 or less from our hand for free. While this is 6 mana and sorcery speed, the power of this card in refilling our hand and allowing us to refund some of our initial investment is too much value to pass up. Shamanic Revelation is another sorcery speed spell, this time drawing cards based on the number of creatures we control and gaining us 4 life for each of those creatures with power 4 or greater. The number of creatures we expect to have on the field at any given time means we can expect to draw at least 4 to 5 cards when cast in it. And because a good number of our creatures can meet the 4 power threshold, our commander most importantly, we can actually use this as a valuable life gain tool when our life is getting low. Soul of the Harvest is a 6 mana creature with Trample that draws us cards every time a non-token creature ETBs. Being a creature itself and triggering card draw upon creature casts is reason enough to justify its inclusion. But coming along as a 6-6 with Trample is also a nice bonus, especially when the game gets grindy and all that's left is combat damage in the meantime. Sylvan Library is simply a cheap and effective way to draw cards or filter the top of our library to make sure our draws are good. Our plan isn't to sit around for a long game if we can help it, so don't be afraid to pay 8 life if your life total is healthy or it will help you close out the game. Voice of Many is a 4 mana elf that draws us a card for each opponent who has less creatures than we do upon ETB. So if we are very unlucky, this card will draw us no cards, but more often than not this will draw us 2-3 cards on average. While certainly not as impressive as most other cards in this category, being a creature, specifically an elf, and having this effect as an ETB was enough synergy to make it worthy of inclusion. Our last card in this category is the Great Henge, which is a 9 mana value artifact whose casting cost can be reduced by the greatest power of a creature we control. Often this will be Yaver, meaning you can often expect to pay 5 mana for it. But for that cost, not only does it give you 2 green mana and 2 life upon tapping it, but it also draws you a card and gives a plus 1 plus 1 counter to every non-token creature that enters our battlefield. Considering all the benefits this card provides us with regards to its casting cost, card advantage, mana and life gain, this is one of our best value engines in the deck. So now that we've seen how we're going to draw cards, let's have a look at how we're going to interact with our opponents. Acidic Slime is a 2-2 death touch creature that can destroy an artifact, enchantment or land upon ETB. So on the surface this would seem to be a source of non-creature removal, which is great to have, especially the land removal component. But with Yaver out, we can cast this in response to attackers to block and kill a key creature of our opponents, making this creature removal too. Apex Altasaur is a 10-10 that fights a creature we don't control upon ETB, but every time it is dealt damage, we can have it fight up to one target creature again. Because every fight should result in some damage being done to Altasaur, this should ensure we can fight multiple creatures upon having it hit the field. In essence, it becomes our way of wiping at least some of the board, and it makes our opponents hesitant in swinging in our way, because we can keep doing this every turn if we are attacked. We can also swing in with this in combat and give our opponent the tough choice of blocking and having their other creatures fighting Altasaur and probably dying, or taking the big damage. Now costing 9 mana to cast is high, but you have seen our mana acceleration package and can probably see this won't be too hard to achieve. In addition, having the effect be repeatable is very powerful and relevant, especially if we can trigger it every turn, which will prevent our opponents from having any creatures stick. Beast Within is cheap and universal removal for a permanent that we need gone right away. Specifically being able to hit lands and planeswalkers is relevant, as Mono Green doesn't typically have many ways of dealing with these permanents, especially at instant speed. Reclamation Sage is a 3 mana elf that can destroy an artifact or enchantment upon ETB. Being cheap to cast, a creature and specifically an elf are all attributes that make it a worthwhile include in the deck. Druid of Purification costs 1 more mana than Reclamation Sage, but can potentially hit more targets. When it ETBs, starting with us, 
Each player may choose an artifact or enchantment we don't control, and if they do, they get destroyed. What I love about this card in the deck is the versatility depending on our position in the game. When we are behind, which should be most of the time in commander games, this should hit 2-4 to four targets, making it an incredible rate for the cost. But when we are ahead, it will only hit one target, which should be more than fine because us being ahead usually means having access to a lot of mana and a lot of cards. Endurance is our answer to the graveyard players and, in less common circumstances, the mill players at the table. When it ETBs, one player puts all the cards from their graveyard on the bottom of their library in a random order. The great thing about Endurance is not only does it have flash, meaning we don't need Yaver out to use it at instant speed, but we can evoke it at the cost of exiling one green card in our hand. So if worse comes to worse and the graveyard or mill players are about to go off, we have an answer for them. Foundation Breaker is a 4 mana version of Reclamation Sage, except we can evoke it for 2 mana if we need the effect right away and can't afford the full cost. Having that kind of cost flexibility is always welcome, especially in a deck that operates at instant speed, because unless your opponents know this deck really well, they won't expect a 2 mana creature that has this effect. Cogler, the Titan Ape, pulls triple duty by acting as creature, artifact and enchantment removal attached to a powerful body at 7 power and 6 toughness. When it ETBs, it can fight up to one creature we don't control, which should be able to take care of most problematic creatures. But on attack, it can also destroy an artifact or enchantment defending player controls, making it a repeatable interaction piece for artifacts and enchantments. This alone makes it worth including, as any deck should highly value repeatable interaction, but Cogler also has additional utility. For one generic and a green, it can return a human we control to our hands to give Cogler indestructible until end of turn. We haven't gone over all our creatures yet, but there are many we would like to protect in response to removal or a board wipe. For example, Karametra's Acolyte, Duskwatch Recruiter and Shaman of Forgotten Ways are just some humans integral to our game plan. So make sure to pay attention to your creature types when Cogler is out, as it may just open up some powerful synergies and combos you didn't know you had in the deck. Ram Through is a removal piece that allows us to deal damage to an opponent's creature based on the power of one of our creatures. And while this is certainly welcome, especially in green that can have trouble effectively removing creatures, it isn't the prime reason it is in the deck. Its other ability, being able to deal excess damage to a player if our creature has trample, is why it's really here. Having your cards pull multiple duties is always something to look for, and here this can act as a win con at instant speed with the right setup. For example, imagine casting Craterhoof Behemoth but not having enough damage to finish the table. With Ram Through, Pick the largest creature we have and make it fight an opponent's creature to get the last damage through to win the game. In more convoluted situations where you can recur this, you can also just ram through multiple times to kill your opponents. Song of the Dryads is our answer to any permanent that has given us problems, but most of the time we want to use this on powerful commanders that we don't want to see our opponents recurring from the command zone. There are a significant number of decks that are commander centric, so if we can largely shut them down with one card, that makes our life much easier only having two players left to deal with. Terastodon is expensive at 8 mana, but being able to destroy 3 non-creature permanents at the cost of replacing them with 3-3 elephants is a price we are happy to pay. This creature can quickly swing the game around if it is turned against us, and coming with a 9-9 body means this will act as a great beater after its ETB effect is triggered. Thorn Mammoth is likely the best creature removal we have in the deck. When it or another creature ETBs, Thorn Mammoth fights up to one creature we don't control. Because our deck plans on casting spells on other players' turns, this means we can essentially trigger its fight effect on every player's turn. If Thorn Mammoth lasts 1-2 to two turn rotations at the table, it is likely most of your opponent's creatures will be gone. Our last interaction piece is Ulvenwald Tracker. Cheap to get down, if we tap it and pay one generic and a green, we can have a target creature we control fight another target creature. Ulvenwald Tracker is a great removal piece for creatures that is importantly repeatable, so you'll be rarely sad to see it. It also works particularly well with Apex Altasaur, as it can help to restart its board wiping effect by getting a damage trigger from fighting. So now we know how the deck interacts, we will need a few ways to be able to protect our creatures and board state. And while the options are limited in mono green, we do have a few key pieces that are important for the deck. First up is Allosaurus Shepherd. For only 1 mana, it can't be countered and it makes all our green spells uncounterable. This is a cheap and effective solution to counter spells and is best used in response to an opponent countering one of our spells. Being a permanent solution to counter spells is also very valuable for us, as once this sticks we can feel much safer resolving our spells on the stack. But Allosaurus's usefulness doesn't end there. 
Its activated ability to give all our elves a base power and toughness of 5-5 means this can act as a finisher or combat trick too. Heroic Intervention is a 2 mana instant that gives all our permanents hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. This is our best protection card for saving our board from a board wipe, and we will sometimes even use it to save a single key card. In a pinch, we can also use it offensively to give our attackers protection if we are swinging out big, and it is likely we will lose some of those creatures. Our final protection piece is Sarath, the Viper's Fang. Sarath gives our tapped creatures death touch, our untapped creatures hexproof, and if we pay one and tap it, we can untap another creature or land we control. So to start with, we can flash in Sarath in response to targeted removal to protect the targeted creature, and once it resolves, it provides that protection to all our creatures, which is fantastic. But maybe we're being attacked by a bigger or important creature like a commander and only have small creatures like dorks on the field. Well, we can flash this in response to attackers being declared, announce our mana dork as a blocker, tap it for mana, and now that it has death touch, that attacking creature will now die regardless of how big it is. If we're lucky, we can also use that mana from the mana dork for something else too, just to rub salt into the wound. Lastly, Sarath being able to untap a creature or land can enable some pretty powerful things to occur. Just imagine being able to untap a Circle of Dreams Druid, Karametra's Acolyte, or Itlamot Cradle of the Sun for a second burst of mana. What if an opponent sends a removal spell at a tapped creature we control? Just untap it with Sarath and now it has Hexproof, Fizzle in the spell. Sarath is a very powerful card in this deck and its utility is so great, I almost included it in our utility section. Which, speaking of, is the next section we'll look at. These cards not only take advantage of Yaver's ability to operate at instant speed, but they also open up our combo lines to win in the game. Let's begin with Quest for Renewal, which is a 2 mana enchantment that gains a quest counter whenever one of our creatures becomes tapped. If we get 4 or more of these counters, all of our creatures untap during each other player's untap step. Because almost all of our ramp is attached to creatures, this will very easily allow us to generate the mana to cast multiple spells during each opponent's turns. Wellwisher is a 2 mana elf that gains us life for each elf we have in play. When coming up against decks that attack life totals aggressively, this creature will be key in preserving our life total until we can close out the game. Because it is a tap ability too, we can also abuse it with cards like Sarath or the aforementioned Quest for Renewal. Thousand Year Elixir is an artifact that allows our creatures to activate their abilities as though they had haste. It can also tap for one to untap a creature. We have already discussed some of the powerful creatures we can untap with untap effects, so we won't go down that road again, but suffice to say this is always a very welcome effect when we can get it. However, it's the Elixir's first ability that most interests us. If we have this out, every Mana Dork we cast on an opponent's turn can now tap for mana immediately. If we combine this with a card draw effect, we can easily storm off on our opponent's turn. Kadama of the East Tree allows us to cheat permanents with equal or lesser mana value into play for every permanent we put into play that wasn't from Kadama's ability. This allows us to evade counter magic so we can get the key cards we need onto the board, especially those that, once they hit the battlefield, have their effect immediately, for example, creatures with ETB effects. The floor for Kadama will usually be putting some lands into play that we drew but couldn't make use of, which is still a useful and relevant effect, just showing how powerful its ability is. Quirion Ranger is a 1 mana elf that can return a forest to our hand once per turn to untap a creature. This can help get multiple untaps a turn cycle from one of our big mana dorks to generate us a lot of mana. It won't matter if we've bounced multiple forests to our hand because by that point, we will already be in a position to win the game. It also serves a key role as a combo piece which we will get to soon. Wirewood Symbiote serves a similar role to Quirion Ranger, untapping a creature, but this time at the cost of returning an elf to our hand. Unlike the Ranger however, Wirewood has some extra synergies with elves in our deck. For example, it can bounce back a Reclamation Sage or Voice of Many to reuse their ETB effects multiple times, and it can also save an important elf from removal, like our commander. Team of Sabretooth allows us to return other creatures we control to our hands at the cost of one generic and a green mana per creature we target. This serves multiple purposes for the deck. It allows us to reuse creatures with powerful ETB effects, it protects a creature in response to targeted removal, and with enough mana, it can potentially bounce our entire board back to our hand in response to a board wipe. Great Oak Guardian is a combat trick and mana ritual all in one card, untapping all of our creatures and giving them plus two plus two until end of turn upon ETB. With Team of Sabretooth and enough dorks out, we can generate infinite mana and make our creatures infinitely huge. But even without going infinite, this can generate a lot of mana with the right board setup, and the plus two plus two buff can be relevant, 
especially considering we can target our opponent's creatures with this. That's right, it specifies target players, so if we need to keep an opponent alive so we can stay alive, we can flash this in, untap their creatures and allow them to block, buying us more time. Cloudstone Curio says that whenever a non-artifact permanent enters the battlefield under our control, we may return another permanent that shares a type with it to its owner's hand. By now you've seen most of the cards in the deck. A significant number of them have or trigger ETB effects. So being able to easily reuse them is a very powerful effect to have in this deck, especially at instant speed. But its versatility doesn't stop there. Maybe we just need to use it for protection. So, flash in a cheap mana dork and bounce the important creature back to our hand. What if we have Thousand Year Alexa and this out with a mana dork like Karametra's Acolyte that taps for multiple green? Just keep tapping it for mana, bouncing it by casting another creature, recasting it, and rinsing and repeating for infinite mana. Don't be surprised if you continue to find powerful interactions with this card long after playing the deck. A Shire, Soul of the Wild, has power and toughness based on the number of lands we control. But it also has another static ability that says, non-token creatures we control are forest lands in addition to their other types. So a Shire essentially turns all our creatures into mana dorks, and by their nature of being lands in addition to their other types, they avoid non-land removal, such as Cyclonic Rift. She also combos to create infinite mana with Quirion Ranger and a mana dork that taps for at least two mana. The combo works like this. We activate Quirion Ranger's ability to target the dork after it's tapped and return the ranger to our hand, because it's a forest thanks to a shire. Then using one of the mana, we recast Quirion Ranger and then repeat, netting us one mana each cycle. At the very least, a shire tends to become quite large and can make great use of cards that care about a creature's power like Ram Through, Return of the Wild Speaker, and Salvala Heart of the Wilds. Our final utility card could almost be called the mascot of the deck, and is the card Yeva decks are typically known for. That card is Seedborn Muse. Being able to untap all our permanents on each player's untap step very quickly sends us ahead in the game, and if we have at least one piece of card draw with it too, well, it won't be long before the game is over for your opponents. Just make sure to cast this card at the right time, hopefully with protection if possible, because it is one of the best cards in the deck, and your opponents will know that too. So that covers our utility cards, and as you can see, they enable some very powerful plays. But what happens when we lose some of these cards? We're going to want ways to recur them, so let's have a look at our small recursion package. First up is Eternal Witness, a 3 mana elf that returns any card from our graveyard to our hand upon ETB. This is quite simply a very powerful effect for the cost, and being attached to a body means it also has other important synergies in the deck. For example, with Team of Sabretooth and a large amount of mana, we can repeatedly trigger its effect, returning multiple cards. And if we hit infinite mana, we can return our entire graveyard to our hand. Don't forget we can also do the same thing with Cogler the Titan Ape, as mentioned earlier, as well as Cloudstone Curio. Having multiple ways to recur Eternal Witness's ability is what really sets this card ahead in power level for the deck. And because we value such traits highly, our last recursion piece is Timeless Witness, a 4 mana human shaman that has the same effect, but also gives us the option to eternalize it from our graveyard, getting its effect a second time at the cost of exiling it from our graveyard. Most of the time we never use that second ability because like Eternal Witness, we want to be able to use its ability multiple times. While Timeless Witness is the weaker version of Eternal Witness, its ability is so powerful and relevant we are happy for the redundant effect, even if it is more costly. And that rounds out all the non-land cards in the deck. Now let's finish up by examining our land base and any key lands that have synergy with our game plan. Our first land is the MDFC, Barlaged Recovery. As we mentioned earlier, we highly value our recursion pieces, and because we only run a few of them, having extra redundancy is very welcome. Being a tapped land isn't as much of a problem here as in other decks because we can generate a lot of mana naturally. Kalni Ambush is another MDFC, and adds to our interaction package by allowing a creature we control to fight one we don't. Creature removal is typically harder to find in mono green, and being an instant in addition to a land when we need it was enough to warrant its inclusion. Our final MDFC is Turn Timber Symbiosis. Being able to come in untapped for the cost of 3 life means we don't really lose anything by playing this, especially considering our density of basic forests in the deck, which is more than enough for the cards that care about basics like Arbor Elf and Earthcraft. But when we need it, we can cast it to hopefully put into play a key creature like a card advantage engine to move our game plan forward. Beseju, who endures, can come into play as an untapped green source, or we can use it to remove a problematic artifact, enchantment, or non-basic land and opponent controls. Having such diversity on an untapped land is a great thing to have, 
and it allows us to increase our interactive package without sacrificing a land. It also works really well with Cloudstone Curio, as we can play a land and bounce this back to our hand if we urgently need the interaction. Cavern of Souls allows us to get around counter magic, and due to our density of elves in the deck, this land will often tap for green and get key elves we want into play, like Circle of Dreams Druid or Beast Whisperer. Emergent Zone is a colorless land that we can pay one and sacrifice to allow all our spells to be cast with flash, not just our creatures. Some key non-creature spells, like Cloudstone Curio, Thousand Year Elixir and Shamanic Revelation, become very powerful if we can flash them in on an opponent's turn when we are ready to go off. Nykthos Shrine to Nyx is the land version of Karametra's Acolyte, and like it can generate an incredible amount of mana to really set us ahead of the game. Pair this with some card draw and a land untapper like Sarath the Viper's Fang, and it will be hard for your opponents to overcome that much value. Speaking of untappers, we can also get this effect on Deserted Temple, a colorless land that we can pay one and tap to untap another target land. This has been included almost exclusively for Nykthos and the mana they can generate together, but it also has a fun and interesting synergy with a Shire and any creature that has a tap effect. Because the Shire makes all our non-token creatures forest lands, we can use Deserted Temple to untap any tapped creature and get their effect again, like Ulvenwald Tracker, Wellwisher, or Karametra's Acolyte. Wirewood Lodge is a colorless land that allows us to pay one green and tap it to untap target elf. This land can help us generate a lot of mana when paired with one of our big mana elves like Circle of Dreams Druid, Salvala, Wirewood Channeler, Elvish Arch Druid, and Marwyn. Our final utility land is Yavamaya Cradle of Growth. We run a good number of utility lands in the deck that tap for colorless, so having the ability to tap for green with them really helps when casting multiple spells per turn, especially color intensive ones like Lanoir Tribe and Circle of Dreams Druid. Almost every other land in the deck is a basic forest, though if we do get one to two new utility lands that are worth including, we should have room without affecting color fixing or cards that care about having basics. And that's the deck! Yaver does everything you love about mono green, playing big creatures, making lots of mana and drawing lots of cards. But the seemingly simple ability of being able to cast creatures at flash really changes the dynamics of the deck and opens up some interesting lines of play. But unlike most other mono green decks, you stay engaged throughout the turn cycle, you're less susceptible to board wipes, and perhaps most important of all, you can react to opponents' plays in ways they won't expect. You also have the ability to pivot between combat and combo depending on your needs at the time, and you can even win the game on an opponent's turn. Well, I hope you enjoyed this inside look into Yaver Nature's Herald. If you want to see how the deck plays out, make sure to stop by the channel where we will have some gameplay videos up for you guys to watch. But until then, take care guys.